let me start. Okay, back to Haskell. So um, let's see, I need to get to the controller. Uh, so we need to start with hello world um, and the decipher a little bit what uh, what are some magical things uh, happening? So let's go to uh, let's go to so uh, two thousand and six, and let me start. Um, is are the fonts enough? Do you do you see the text? Can make it a little bit bigger. So let's let's do stack new. I will call the project WC. And we go there and I just to call. So um there is a little bit of magic that happens with the with Haskell and with IO. Uh, IO is kind of a, a unique thing. Uh, originally, when uh, when the designers of Haskell did Haskell, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, Haskell didn't have IO. Like you couldn't uh, do side effects. You could only process things. So it, it could consume stuff from the standard input. And produce stuff to the standard output, and there were no um, other kind of I/O uh, primitives, right? And that was for making the programs always pure. Um, so, what what is this kind of a purity um, a purity thing? Well, um, let's do this big. Okay, so. Yeah, um, this function is using uh, IO monad, and this function is not pure because it has kind of side effects. A side effect is that something will show up on the screen, right? Um, so let's uh, let's rename this function. Oh, come on, work. Um, I will call it WC. And this WC function is not uh, pure. But let's uh, have, um, uh, let's write some function that is pure, um, maybe um, count lines. Okay. So imagine that you have a function count lines. And this function takes a string uh, and produces an int, right? And this function is pure uh, because it doesn't use any sort of side effects. And for an, a given string, for a given text, it will just count the lines and return the same thing, right? Uh, so functions are, are pure when the outcome of the function depends entirely on the parameters which are passed to the function. Uh, and then uh, the functions are not pure if they have some sort of side effects in which in uh, most uh, systems mean some sort of IO, right? So if we doing something with the network or if we're doing something with the screen or with a file and so on, like we're interacting with the outside world, right? Um, so one exception to that is, um, so uh, WC is a command which counts you the uh, lines, words, and bytes of a text file. So in, in our case, we have, um, for example, uh, stack YAML, right? So if I cut stack YAML file, you will see it's a text file, which has some, some text. And what I can do is I can say, count me all the, uh, lines of the of the text file right um and it actually prints stuff on the on the console right um so 
um, the command line has this ability for a uh, piping kind of inputs and outputs of, of programs in such a way that we can uh, do a uh, more complicated thing. So for example, I can print the stack YAML and then I can pipe it to WC, right? And as you see, uh, it prints the same thing, but this time it didn't read the parameter, the, the text, the, the, the file from the command line. It was actually fed with the data from the standard input. Um, so did you work with uh, standard input output before, like in uh, operating systems or in some other courses? Yeah, so, so it is kind of like, a, uh, imagine that your, your program prints something to the standard output, which is usually what we do, like for example, with format uh, print line, right? What happens is we are printing something to the standard output, right? Um, so in, in the case of, um, so if I go, let's go to this um, prog, Um, playground. Yeah. So I have I have this. Um, I remember I have this uh, store, which prints stuff on the, into the standard uh, standard output, right? And then once it it calculates stuff, it it shows up here. Um, but I'm not actually printing it to the screen. I'm dumping it to the standard output and then the shell prints it to the screen. And to demonstrate it, I can pipe it into a file like output.txt. And then I will not see anything on the console, um, but the two numbers will be, you see I, like now executing that command didn't printed me anything. It put them into the output file. And they are now in the output file, right? Uh, so what I can do is I can kind of uh, pipe it, like channel it through uh, multiple stages. So I can run the score. Um, I can uh, feed the output of this through uh, WC. And then I can feed the output of that to an output file, right? So now uh, output two. So now what happens is uh, store calculates those two numbers, prints them to the standard output, which is sort of those two, two numbers. Then WC takes those th this text and then counts the number of lines and count number of words. In our case, it's two lines and four words and puts it into the, uh, and then at the end of the processing, we, we pipe it into the output two, right? So output two, now is two lines and four words and 24 characters, right? So by doing this kind of a pipe operator, uh, which is, okay, takes whatever this thing produces and pipe it to here, and whatever this thing produces, pipe it to there, we can chain, um, chain our processing. Um, and that's uh, what the kind of uh, command line and, and shells were doing such that you can kind of uh, do things kind of, uh, you know, one after the other and then pipe things together. So if you think about this, uh, then I can have a program. If, if my program is prog and the prog takes some input like uh, from a file and produces some output in, into another file, like by, by saying file, I mean this kind of a standard input, standard output, right? I can talk about prog being pure, right? Even though prog is doing IO, prog is really pure because for the same input, it will always do the same output, right? So in that case, we can have pure programs, even though they don't um, are technically pure because they kind of do IO, right? They read from standard input and put into standard output. And that's how Haskell originally was. So Haskell was allowing you to write programs like this, which were consuming stuff and producing things, uh, but they couldn't print anything to the screen, right? They couldn't have like a read file or 
print to the screen, right? Primitives. Um, so that's um, that's how the um, the purity kind of works. And in our case, we now in Haskell we have uh, this um, we have this um, put string line which puts text into a standard output. So, and it is inside the IO monad, uh, but it is um, sort of, uh, you can uh, consume things from standard input and put things into the standard output. Um, and this way you can, um, you can uh, write programs which do some processing. So originally, um, Haskell was kind of uh, designed for uh, writing text processors and writing compilers and writing kind of uh, uh, some manipulations of uh, input which was fed into, into it from a standard input. All right, so uh, before the break, um, let's run this. So if I say stack run, oh, I am in the wrong. Sorry, I am in the wrong uh, stack run then uh, it will build and it will execute the, uh, yeah, the printing of some punk. Um, so, you know, main, main calls WC and WC is defined as printing something to the, to the you know, hello world to this uh, string, to, to the screen. Uh, All uh, right, so do we, yes, we export it. We do this, we do this. We import lib. Okay, so if we retry, it should work. I had, I probably didn't save the lib, lib file. So now it builds, runs and prints like some punk. Um, so one extra comment, um, when, when you say stack build, it builds the executable, it builds the actual executable, but it's not in the main folder. Like if you do go build, it builds you an executable and the executable is in here, uh, but in, um, in uh, Haskell and in using stack, the executable is a little bit hidden. So to run the executable, you have to say stack, uh, yeah, so we have to stack work and then uh, this, and then your platform you are on, in my case is OS X, and then uh, the version of the cabal that you're using, and then build, and then you have uh, the folder for an executable, and then you have the actual executable. And by convention, the executable is always called like the, the module name. So in our case, it's WC uh, and then dash exe. So it's a little bit mixture of how Windows calls executables and how uh, you call it, right? Like how, how the given platform calls them. So that, that's the kind of the executable that you end up being generated. So if I ask what it is, it will tell me, okay, it's an executable on X64. And it's like a Mac OS um, executable, right? And then you can kind of run it by hand by calling it. Um, so if you if you run it, it will basically do the same thing, like print something on the screen. Um, and if you run it and you pipe it to an output file, then of course it will print nothing on the screen, but your file will contain whatever that the output is, right? Uh, but as for convenience, you can always say stack run and it basically runs that executable. So it's the same as just running it yourself. But you see when I call stack run, like, okay, let's time it. Stack run. That took uh, like 2.7 seconds. If I run it myself, it took 50 milliseconds, right? It was almost instantaneous, why? Well, if you call stack run, first you have to load stack, right? So that's already a bit costly. So stack needs to start bootstrap 
and then stack needs to say okay do you want to run executable i have to check if i need to recompile it right so it checks all your source code if the timestamp is different from the executable to your source code and checks if anything needs to be recompiled and if it needs to be recompiled it will recompile it and after this check it says okay now the executable is up to date i can run it and only then it runs it right so there are some some extra steps that stacks do that's why run, doing stack run is slower than just calling it yourself uh, so when you time you should never really time calling stack run because then you also timing how stack works right uh, so if you want to to time your application you have to kind of run it by hand like like this all right so let's uh let's quickly move on uh there there is one more thing before the break so yeah we we will do it after the break uh we will do it after the break pipes we covered yeah so doing kind of a piping from from one to the other um Yeah, so yeah, we don't have to do that. So now uh, we, uh, I showed you like what WC does, like it, it's a word count. Um, and the question for you is, um, how would you write it like imperatively, right? So you would need to open a file. Um, you would need to iterate over all the lines from that file, right, counting the lines um you would for each line you would need to split the line into words and count the words uh and then you would need to add them like you know into the like in the big loop that you are doing uh and then you would print the totals for lines and for the words so that that's kind of the logic that you would follow uh to do it kind of uh, in, imperatively in golang for example uh and then you of course you would need to think a little bit how you're reading stuff right so how much buffers you should use? Should you read line by line? We already learned that reading line by line is a bit slow. Uh, that would not be a, a good performing mechanism, but you know, I can give you like a four gigabyte file to count the lines and or like you know one terabyte file. And then it might be larger than your RAM. So you cannot read the whole file, right? So you need to think, okay, how much file can I read at once? How I should split my processing? uh how should i do this right so there are two questions for you uh one is um how how confident you are writing that program without looking up stuff on the internet um it's hard um when I was a student, we had to write programs without the internet because uh, there was no internet yet. So that was that was already quite hard, but that was not the hardest. Uh, like writing programs on a computer without the internet with the books and, and stuff like that. The hard part for us was that we almost always had to write programs on a piece of paper without a computer. <laughs> so we were writing programs on like you know pen and paper without a computer in the class and the teacher was checking if we wrote the programs correctly right <laughs> that was a nightmare <laughs> because you couldn't press compile like you couldn't even check if your program kind of compiles right uh there was no syntax highlighters there was nothing like you just had pen and paper and piece of paper and you had to write programs like that that yeah <laughs> <laughs> the old fashioned way yeah <laughs> all right so uh most of you would not be able to write it uh some of you just need to look up a uh, couple of things uh on the internet um so there is a second question about the same thing but in golang The answers probably will be similar, uh, although I have to admit Golang is a bit simpler uh, and probably you can. Uh, uh, you can probably look up less things. Um, 
I would need to look up less things for Golang than for C++. Um, all right, so I will leave that at that point. Uh, let's have a 10 minute break. Uh, and those people who want, uh, you can try to write WC and Golang or in some other programming language uh, that you um, that you know the best. Uh, and as as I showed, like what what the program should do is um, uh, we will have uh, so you will end up with a program which is uh, called WC or something like this, uh, and that program. Um, takes uh, some input like pipe from a standard input uh, where we push files to it, right? So it will kind of uh, read stuff um, from the standard input, right? Uh, so I could uh, cut a file into it um, like this, or I can push stuff into it like this. So you don't need to open a file. You just need to just read from standard input. And then what you do is you count uh, count lines and words, uh, and then you print two numbers out again into standard output. Um, all right, so let's have a break, and then I will rename my project because uh, WC is not the best choice. Um, Uh, my code broke. Okay.
All right, time's up. So let's go back. So some people said that uh, they would not able to write it without looking up on the internet. So the, uh, the question is, what do you need to look up on the internet? So um, I guess opening, like reading and opening standard input for uh, reading and writing, right? Writing in Golang is easy. We've been using it for a while already. So format.printline, format.printf, uh, they all dump into standard output. So you don't need to look that up. You probably already know that. Uh, reading from a file, um, yeah, that, that you may need to look up. The, the, like once you start using it, that's kind of easy because you have the OS package and then the OS package, you open a file and then you start uh, reading and writing from it or to it. Um, and then the rest is relatively straightforward, right? So just going over the, the files line by line. Uh, is there anything additional that you would need to look up apart from like opening how to read um, lines or, or content from standard output, standard input, output? Um, yeah, so one, one comment about looking up on the internet, um, when you have a task, uh, you, the best, the best thing is to first think, how would you solve it? So kind of a map in your head, how, what steps would you use or what, what do you need to solve it? And then you can look up, um, the whole thing. You can say, okay, counting lines and counting words in, uh, Golang and see how others kind of uh, solved it and if their solution is better than yours or not. Or you can look up the kind of individual parts that you need to, to, to solve it. Um, all right, so let me try, um, let, me, let us try to do it in Haskell. Uh, I know you, um, you, you don't know Haskell that, that well yet, so I, I will kind of, um, I will attempt it um, and uh, by, by kind of thinking aloud, right? So we have to print two numbers uh, and I need to calculate those, those two numbers. Uh, and we will be printing stuff into the console. So I can use the print string uh, line, but I want everything to be in single line. So I want to, to, this to be the last line, right? So this will be the last line. Uh, and I want to print uh, print the number of words. And then the first one will be, uh, I need to do uh, put string and this will be print the number of lines. Okay, uh, and between them, I want to have uh, an empty space. So I will probably like to have this, right? So that's my general structure of my main, uh, of my program, right? Um, so now I need to count the, the lines uh, and I need to read the whole content from the input file, right? For, from the in, uh, standard input. And in Haskell, there is a, um, uh, utility functions that give you the, um, the content of the standard input and you can read it either as the whole um, and that is called get contents contents or you can get it line by line so that is called get line right so this one uh, returns the next line uh, and this one gives you the whole thing at once, okay? Do we want to read line by line or do we want to read the whole thing at once? Well, I don't really want to do any looping. I don't want to kind of uh, loop through my, through my stuff. So I don't want to use get line because if I get the line, I need to do something with that line. I need to then loop, read, get another line and I need to keep track of the counts and that is so complicated, right? I don't want to do that. So I will do, um, I will get the whole thing, right? So I will get the whole thing. And then 
if I do this, that's kind of illegal because that would mean I create a new function called whole, which does what get contents does, right? Uh, so I want to assign uh, what get contents gets me into the whole, uh, into some sort of variable. Um, and we will talk a little bit about um, next time, but I have to use a do keyword here. And do keyword converts my purely functional programming into something that is sort of executed uh, in, a, in a sequence. So I have sort of a, a, a syntactic sugar to express certain sequences of things using kind of like imperative programming like um, structure, right? Uh, and then I will call get contents uh, and get contents returns all the user input as a single string. Uh, and then I will have it assigned to the whole and then I can do some, some things with this. So um, the next thing I get is uh, I need to calculate how many lines that uh, whole string has, right? So I need to split it into, um, uh, well, if, if I were a Golang programmer, I would have to do, um, I would need to say split, and I would need to say split me the whole based on the, um, based on the end of lines, right? And then I will get a slice of strings and each string will be a single line, right? So that's what I would kind of do in Golang. Uh, in Haskell, the, the same thing is achieved by calling lines. So the, the call in, uh, in Haskell is called lines. So if I do lines call, I will get an, a list of all the lines which the whole string has, right? Uh, and now I don't really want the list of all the lines, I want to count them. So counting the, the size of the list is called length. So I am calculating the length of lines of the whole. And now I have to put it together, right? Um, how can I put it together? I can put it together by putting those two things into, uh, into brackets. And that would mean do lines on whole, give me the list and then calculate length of, on that list. Uh, so that's way, one way of doing it. Uh, another way is doing, saying uh, length takes the right hand side of the dollar sign as a parameter. And that one is do lines first. Um, it's kind of a matter of style uh, or yet another one is like this. And then that's um, the one which we will talk a little bit more a little bit later. And that's the one which is that feels more idiom the most idiomatic way of, of doing that, right? Because I can uh, then do so so what this what this will do to me, uh, sorry, what this line, what line 11 will do is it will calculate a number which is uh, the size of the list of all the lines of the of the whole text, right? Um, but this is a number. So because it's a number, I cannot really uh, print it because put string takes a string, right? So if you uh, check what the um, uh, what put string takes, it takes a string and uh, returns an IO action. So I need to convert this number to um, to a string and that is done by a show. Uh, so show uh, converts whatever is a parameter of it into uh, a string. And then I will, uh, I will need, oh, come on. Then I will need to print it, right? So put, put string. So, Let's do it like this. So uh, this will, uh, that doesn't like it. So print the number of lines and then let's not do that yet. Let's just test this, right? So uh, let's, let's do the words uh, at the same time. So then uh, with printing the number of words, uh, that would be similar. So I have to convert lines 
on the whole, I need to get, now I need to, actually I don't need to, uh, to split the whole into uh, lines. I need to split it, split it into words. Uh, and then I need to calculate the length of that. And I need to show it. Uh, and then I need to pass it to print put string line. Uh, and this one is Well, it suggests that I can just use print, uh, but I don't want to use print. I want to use put string line. Um, so let's, before we dive into this, let me double check that I wrote correct thing. So I will say stack build. I did, no errors. That's unusual. Um, so if I say stack run and I feed it with uh, what we were using, stack YAML, then it says 68. Well, uh, that's a little bit surprising because we were expecting two numbers, right? Uh, so why we only have one number? Um, No, he didn't save it. That's why. So let's go back. Uh, and yeah, so now the beauty of stack run, it will recompile uh, because I changed one of the input files. It will recompile and then run it. Uh, and we kind of expect two numbers. So indeed, we have two numbers. We have a number of lines, which is 68, and a number of words, which is 321. Let's double check it with uh, WC. And it says 68, 67 lines and 321 words. So our program works, and our program does what it should do. And our program is expressed in a very, very concise way where I'm not doing any looping, right? Uh, the looping is hidden by the words and by the, by the lines command uh, and the lines, right? So those two functions take a string and convert it into a list. And then I can do stuff on the list and I don't really need to loop, right? Uh, the looping is sort of done a little bit by this function because it gets me the whole file, right? Uh, and it does it lazily. Uh, and I don't kind of manage the buffers myself. The runtime system manages the buffers for me. So hopefully Haskell is doing kind of a good decisions of allocating sufficient amount of space such that the program is kind of efficient. Uh, but if I were to optimize it, uh, as you can see, uh, I sort of, I am a little bit detached from the, you know, underlying machinery of how it actually is happening, right? But in terms of logic, in terms of uh, like expressing like, uh, the, like what is actually happening, this is very concise. So I'm obtaining, I'm obtaining a list. I cannot use my cursor, like my mouse because the help uh, window shows up. So I'm, I'm using the lines to convert all my input into the list of lines. I'm calculating what's the length of that list. I'm showing it, uh, which is converting to a string and then I'm putting it to the standard output. Uh, I'm putting the space and then I'm doing the same for words. The, you know, logically it's very simple. The, the complexity comes from this, from this dots. Um, so if I were to, rewrite this into something that you are familiar with, right? So I would say put string line and put string line takes one parameter, which is a string, right? So I, we need to get a string and that is obtained by calling show and show takes one thing, which is whatever, like in our case, a number and produces a string and show takes uh, a length 
and length takes one parameter, which is a list, and we need to pass it a list. And that is obtained by words, and then words takes one parameter, which is the whole, right? So if I rewrite that line uh, into kind of a function calls, um, put string takes one parameter, uh, show takes one parameter, length takes one parameter, and words takes one parameter. And we clearly see what's happening because I put the, those things into brackets, right? Um, so now I can also write it, um, put string line takes one parameter. So I can do this. And the right hand side will be evaluated first, and then it will be passed to put string as a parameter. So then I need to do show. Uh, so I can do show and show takes one parameter and length takes one parameter and words takes one parameter and whole. But because whole is the whole, it's the, the same. Uh, I, I don't need to do this, the, the last one, right? So now that they are the same. Um, so why is this? Why is this dot the idiomatic way of doing it? Why is not this way kind of more idiomatic way of doing it? Okay, so we have to talk a little bit about carrying and about functions in, in Haskell. Um, before we start, any questions about this? Any questions about, um, not about this, any questions about the solution to WC? Is there anything like uh, unclear of how it works? Do you think it's a more elegant than in Golang, for example? So I, I think it is more elegant. Uh, whether it is harder to read depends uh, how you got used to reading code, right? So if you were used to reading code uh, this way, uh, that is not much harder, right? And it is one liner, so it is a little bit more dense, but it is, um, yeah, may maybe it is a little bit harder, right? Uh, even if you get used to reading this. <laughs> okay, so uh, carrying. Um, do you know what carry is in programming? Curry is a good uh, Indian dish. I like curries, uh, of course. But what is a curry in programming? All right. So let me explain it in um, in Golang. Uh, so some programming languages allow you to do carrying quite easily. And some programming languages kind of don't, they don't allow you to do carrying that easily. Uh, and you need to uh, use kind of a bit of a uh, syntax, like boilerplate syntax. So I will explain it using Golang, uh, but Golang is not the language where carrying is very um, uh, programmer friendly. So in, Go, in, in Golang, I have to type a little bit more. In C++, it's, it's even worse. And then in Haskell, it's very nice, okay? So in Golang, let's imagine that I have a function which says um, add number, right? So the function add, uh, let's call it func, func add, and I have two integers. I have x and y, and I get an integer back, okay? A very simple function which just adds two numbers, right? So it is kind of like the same as with the plus. I'm redefining the plus, right? Um, in, in, uh, in Haskell, to redefine a plus, I can say add equals plus, right? Uh, that, that will be my redefinition of plus in Haskell. Uh, but in Golang, I cannot do that. I cannot say uh, add function is the same as plus. Like I cannot uh, easily say that, right? So I have to write boilerplate code. And my boilerplate code is um, is this. Um, return x plus y. Okay, so that's how you would redefine um, plus operator in, in Golang. 
and um, that's a little bit of, of typing, right? As I said, uh, so that's Golang. Uh, go long and Haskell oh. come on and Haskell we say at equals plus all right so now I want to define a function which adds one to a, a number. So I want a function which takes one parameter and adds one to, to, that, to that parameter, right? So I want to have a new function, but I want to benefit from the function that I've already written, right? So what I would like to have is I would like to have an add one function, which is func, func add one, and it takes one parameter, which is an int, and produces an int. And it basically calls add with one and x, right? So this is a carry, right? A function uh, which has one of the parameters already substituted, but the other parameters not substituted yet. So it's a partially applied function. Carry is uh, a, a synonym for partially applied function, right? So if I have a function which takes two parameters and I already apply one, then I have a function. Now I have this add one function, uh, which is a partially applied full add function, right? Because I already froze one of the parameters. One parameter is frozen, it's always one, right? Uh, but that it, that the second parameter is not frozen yet. So it means I, from a function which takes two parameters, now I went down to a function which takes one parameter and the other one is already frozen. And that, that transition is called carrying, right? So carrying is um, partially applying a function to a list of parameters such that you get a different function, which is the same as the original one, but one parameter or two parameters are, are frozen. Does it make sense? So in, um, in Golang, to express a carry over add, I have to write this, right? Uh, I, can, I can do it anonymously, right? I can call it like this. And now I have an anonymous function, which is a carry over add, uh, because I froze one of the parameters to, to one. I, I applied one parameter already. The other parameter is not applied and the user can pass the other parameter here, right? So I have a, a kind of a carry of, of add, right? So I have a carry, carry of add function is here, okay? So how could we do that with uh, in Haskell? Um, so it turns out in Haskell, uh, actually behind the scenes, all the functions only take one parameter, right? Uh, that's kind of like, okay, how is that possible? Like we have add, which takes two parameters, right? Uh, we have an add function, which takes X and Y and produces, oops, let's say it takes int and int and it produces an int. Right? That's what add is. And this, me saying x, y equals x plus y is exactly the same as me, as me saying add is plus. Uh, those two lines are exactly the same. Uh, I just don't write the parameters, uh, but the add function is taking two parameters because plus takes two parameters. Uh, so why, what, wh why I'm saying that, um, uh, every function in Haskell takes only one parameter. Well, because add, uh, in fact, is not a function which takes two parameters, but uh, add is a function which takes one parameter, which is an int, and returns a carry, which is a function which takes one parameter 
and produces an int, right? So um, this type definition doesn't say int takes two parameters. No, it says int uh, at doesn't take two parameters. At takes one parameter and returns a function which takes one parameter, which returns an int. So um, uh, if I call at one, two, what happens is that returns, um, that returns a function like in Golang case, like this anonymous function, uh, which takes, uh, um, which takes one parameter. So that let's call it anon, anon function, which has one already frozen and X as a parameter and then applies two to that function, which substitutes this X with two. Does it make sense or, or, or not yet? Um, so when I have this definition, that definition means add takes an int and returns a function, which is a function which takes an, an int and produces an int. So this, this is a function which takes an int and produces an int and add, uh, yeah, may, maybe I should put brackets. It's sort of like this. So we kind of read it like out of convenience that add takes two inputs and produces one output. But in fact, that's not true because the brackets are kind of like here. So add takes an int and produces a function. And to create an add one, um, all I need to do is I, I need to define it that uh, it's like plus one. So I, I already froze one parameter and then I am missing one for the plus. And that's what add takes. So now add one is like this. And I carried the plus. So this, um, this behind the scene is already carried. So there is a kind of anonymous function which takes one parameter, which is the first one. It returns another function which takes one parameter, which is the second one, and then it does x plus y, right? Um, so uh, in Golang, I kind of need to be explicit. I cannot do shortcuts like this or shortcuts like this, uh, but um, it it kind of allows you to um, uh, to create carries on the fly uh, as much as you want. Um, So who understood that? That carrying is partially applying a function to some parameters to a function and getting a new function with smaller number of parameters, right? That's the a general definition of a carry. And then Haskell takes it to an extreme and Haskell says all functions in Haskell only take one parameter and they either return something like which is a, a, volume, a value or they return another function. And even plus uh, pay is kind of a, 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 you know, an instance of that because plus takes one parameter and then returns another function which takes the second parameter and then it does something on, on both of those functions, right? Um, so this kind of a on the fly creation of functions and on the fly creation of carries and kind of a, a manipulation of functions is in the, in the heart of, of Haskell, yeah? Uh, it's, uh, why is that an advantage? Because you can do reuse of code in very kind of um, intuitive and very simple way. Uh, so as, as I was uh, showing you here, if you want to reuse the add function in Golang, uh, that's not very easy because you have to write another function yourself could be anonymous function and you have to call the original function 
by doing all this boilerplate yourself, right? So that's kind of uh, quite complicated. Uh, in Haskell, all you need to say is say uh, plus one, right? And th th there is no problem. Like I cannot, um, I cannot say in like an equivalent would be uh, you want to say I want add one to be add where I already uh, applied one parameter and the second one is missing, right? The second one is missing. The first one is already frozen and I want add one to be a function which takes one parameter. I cannot do that in Golang, right? But I can actually do that in Haskell. And you cannot do really, really do that in a lot of uh, programming languages. Uh, you have to write all this boilerplate, right? So imagine that you, um, you are writing, uh, you, you have a collection in C++ and you have, uh, you want to kind of extract some elements out of the collection and you're overwriting a compare function. Compare function takes two parameters, right? So imagine that you are reusing that function multiple times, but you want to kind of a freeze one of the parameters to a particular value. You cannot really do that. You have to re-implement, re like retype every time you want to freeze one of the parameters because you cannot say, I want to reuse part of the compare, right? I want to say compare and I want to freeze the first one to something, right? And then I just want the, you know, the second one to be substituted by, by something else. Uh, you have to kind of, uh, you, you are stuck with a function which takes two parameters, right? So then reuse of code is kind of hindered. Like it's kind of not that, that easy. Um, so that's one, uh, one big advantage. Uh, and then the second advantage is that it's often a pattern that you use in programming. So let me show you the subsequent slides. So one, um, uh, yeah. So carrying a function is partial application of parameters to a function to obtain sort of like a sub function, which has some parameters frozen. Um, and then it's useful when you're constructing abstractions, right? So because you can decompose a more complex function, let's say you have a kind of a complex function which takes four parameters, right? Then you can very easily obtain four different sub functions with uh, some of the parameters frozen and the sub functions take three parameters, right? You cannot really do that in kind of a normal programming languages. Uh, so it's very useful when constructing abstractions. And then um, carries into extreme makes a multi parameter function into a single parameter function, right? And then uh, one more. So some languages have it, some don't have it. Uh, most languages which don't have it, naturally you can go around it by doing those anonymous functions like in Java, in um, in Python and C++ and so on, you can use anonymous functions and you can kind of pretend that you're doing a carry, but in fact, you're kind of writing all this boilerplate code and you have to call the original function, right? You cannot kind of abstract, abstract that away. Um, and then, uh, so you are uh, like some languages, uh, allow you to do this, like for example, in, um, in, in Java or C++, you sort of have it, but you rarely use it. And then in some lang languages you have it and you are kind of encouraged to use it. So Golang is, um, is an example where you will use carry actually, uh, because it is a mechanism which is used for managing callbacks. Um, so here we have a, a, a simple um, example where, you know, an HTTP response handler takes a function which takes uh, a single parameter, which is an HTTP request, right? And you cannot change that. Like that's how the API is designed and th that's how the API works. But so uh, the function which um, the handler takes, takes only one parameter. But when you are handling the request, most often than not, you need to get a handler to a database. So uh, to do kind of a database operations, you need a function which takes a request and the database, right? So you have a function which takes two parameters, but you want to go down to a function where uh, you only have one, right? So all you want to do is you want to uh, 
have a function which takes two parameters, and then you want to make a carry out of it, which one parameter is frozen, which is your database handler, and then pass that carry to your handler, right? So that's how you will basically use it in Golang, uh, in uh, cloud computing, right? You will have to kind of carry all your more complex functions, which take more parameters, into something which is smaller. And then, you know, obviously when uh, you're writing a library or if you're writing a framework, you don't care about how people are dealing with the business logic. They can do their own complex functions with many parameters the way they want to do it. But all you care is that you get a function with it, which is a carry of that complexity. So, uh, you know, a Golang web framework doesn't care about your complexity of your business logic. All it cares is about, well, I, you know, all I need is to get a carry with the HTTP request um, parameter, right? And that's it. So even though you didn't know what carrying is, you probably have used carries already by you know replacing more complex business functions with more parameters to something that the API was requiring you to pass, right? All right, so I will finish here because we are going over time uh, and you will sort of think about it and then uh, play a little bit with it in Haskell. Uh, as I'm saying, like Haskell is perfect for it because it's so easy to do carries. Uh, you just, you know, if you have a function, um, if you have a function which takes multiple parameters, right? You have some sort of a fun function f which takes, you know, a, b, c, or whatever, then to make a carry, you only call it with some parameters. If you call it only with a, you get uh, uh, a, a new function which takes two parameters, right? If you call it with a and b, then you get a function which takes um, this. Yeah, I'm finishing. <laughs> the, the only constraint is that you cannot carry in, in uh, Haskell, you, you can only carry from the first to the second to the third. So from left-hand side to the right-hand side, right? You cannot say, I want to get a carry, which uh, I, I am replacing the ceiling, and then I have the first two being flexible, right? So when you're defining your API for your functions, you have to think, how will it be carried? Because you have to carry from left to right, right? All right, that's it. We have to go. We have to. Uh, Next time you bring Indian curry. Yeah, in uh, I know. So so much talking about the curry that exactly. um, I got hungry. Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. We actually talk about cloud in the last uh, yeah. uh, moment. And.